Welcome to the Empowering Industry Podcast, a production from Empowering Pumps and Equipment as the voice of the pump and related equipment industry. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 110 of the Empowering Industry Podcast. This is coming out on March 14th, which is my baby Jackson Matthews' birthday and my dad's birthday. So happy, happy birthday to you both. Um, and How old is else Jackson? Who has- Jackson's 16. I just can't like, no, no he'll he's be, gonna be 17. That's I was right. Say, y'all so, have been letting him drive right. illegally if he is right. just turning no. 16. Yeah. So he is 16 today when we're recording this. <laughs> okay. so he will be 17 when this comes out. So happy birthday, Jackson. Um, please try to be more <laughs> careful driving and you're year 17. I don't have any more vehicles to give you. Okay. So. <laughs> I'm your host, Charlie K. Matthews, joined by my co-host, Bethany Womack. We have a lot hey. of fun together. Yes. Hey, Charlie. Uh, happy birthday to Jackson and happy birthday, Charlie's dad. Um, and thank you, everyone, for listening to the show like you do every week. Leave a rating and review that helps us show up, which between now and the next time we record, I'm going to check out those reviews and find a couple good ones that I want to read on the show because I haven't looked at those reviews in a while, but I do appreciate them when they come in. Now's your time. It's to go ahead here. and post that review. And it doesn't even have to say my name specifically, but if it does, I'll probably read it. So Absolutely. Uh This week, we're doing what we do best. We're going to cover social media. We're going to preview the news from Empowering Pumps and Equipment, and then we're going to connect you with an industry influencer. Before we start, how's your week, Uh, Charlie? Man, it was flying. I mean, it's been so busy. It's been great. I've just been, you know, going from one meeting to the next, which I love. Uh, Strategy meetings. So we had a full, you know, half day of strategy meetings with the team, which I liked talking marketing and how we're going to show up this year. And then I've done a lot um, of my own travel planning and one specifically that I want to share. I am going to Uganda, knock on wood or something. Uh, I'm going to do that on May the 5th is the idea. And I don't, if you haven't heard of this, it's around my mission, um, my mission, you know, first, these people need some really good, you know, clean drinking water. So empowering pumps, um, kind of separately sent pumps to Senegal, which is close to where we're going to be. Uh, but I'm going into Kampala and I'm going to do mission work there. Uh, I'm going to fall in love with a lot of children, um, in these different areas. So I, I can't wait to share that experience with everybody. It it ties in, you know, water, children, ministry, like all of that into one trip. Um, so we'll plan something for that. But that's where I was. I was on cloud nine. I got to meet with my, you know, math math teacher, science teacher who uh, did a presentation to a business networking group here locally. So I got to see him in action and see all the pictures uh, of the you know, little girls in dresses that we provided under lilies for Lakeshore and empowering pumps did, you know, sponsor that and send, um, you know, funds to them. And it's just, I don't know, it's beautiful to see these, you know, children in their brand new dress. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an update on it. There's a lot there. So I'll give you an update on that later. I'm so excited for you. I know you've been wanting to do this for a while now and just different things kept getting in the way. And so I'm excited Uh, for you and uh, just to hear how it all goes when you get back. Yes. (laughs) Excuse me. Okay. My week, it is, it's been a hard week. Not going to lie. We had a stomach bug. Um, It's just, which also reminded me as this week, I'm parenting and working uh, with sick children that, you know, we have been living um, in a pandemic for two years. uh, And I think in a lot of ways, we're out of the rough part. Hopefully, knock on some wood. We'll knock on wood mm-hmm. all day. Uh, mm-hmm. But I just wanted to take a moment. I'm sure no one forgot. No one got to this week and thought to themselves, oh, I wonder what happened this week two years ago. But I just want to give everyone a pat on the back for adjusting, yep. pivoting, figuring out how to survive, whether it be in your personal life or your company. Um, and as a thank you from our company to all of our partners and thank you for going with us and moving with us as we felt found new ways to highlight you and I think really serve this community better. So cheers yeah, to us. I, I, I have guess. to um, get you to give your own self a pat on the back too <laughs> for juggling this week. Um, she was on our strategy call and after I went back and looked at some messages, I'm like, why? <laughs> Why did you show up for that? Um, glad hard. you did. We need you. Uh, but 
okay. So this is what we're working with. This is our amazing women out there for one um, and men, but our, our women with childcare, with small children, um, that has been a challenge. And our dads too. I, I hear you. I've, I've seen you in action. Um, but with the small children, um, it's tough. So congratulations on mastering this week because you did yes. it. Slay the day is what we say. Slay the day. Send me tips. I'll take whatever I can get. Um, but to start out the episode, we have some exciting announcements like we did last week, but we just don't want you to miss them. We are coming up on our ad deadline for our digital edition, which is coming out in April. So the ad deadline is going to be this week. It's the middle of the month, March 15th. You'll be able to remember that's actually tomorrow. Uh, but contact Vince. He'd love to get you in that new edition of the digital magazine, which we have a new platform. This will be our second edition, uh, that has gone straight to that new platform. And I think it's really upped, uh, like the readership experience. And so it's a good, a good piece to be involved in. Yes. And I have all the controls and I can like (laughs) move things around how I want to. It's wonderful. Um, Okay. So also we're really excited about Epic. That's the Empowering Pump and Industry Conference. It's going to take place November the 14th and 15th in Pasadena, Texas at San Jacino College. Uh, It's going to be great. I've been talking to people and I'm just really excited about that. Um, it's where industry and the workforce come together to connect. So we're going to connect you with manufacturers, distributors, end users, uh, associations, organizations within our place. Um, and also, um, the students. So the college students that are there and, and maybe some from other colleges surrounding, uh, we'd love to bring you all together in one place. It's going to be a two day event. Like I said, uh, it's going to have presentations from our subject matter experts, Uh, I got to really talk with our advisory board this week and that really makes me happy because it's strong and some hot, you know, top players that I've seen for, you know, nearly two decades now doing some amazing things. Uh, But we're also, (laughs) oh my gosh, that makes me feel old. I know, two decades. (laughs) Uh, Well, well, uh, it it makes me feel accomplished. So we'll go with (laughs) that. Um, Good. Tabletop displays, we'll have some outdoor exhibits. Um, I'm really excited about that, seeing kind of the roll up uh, of the exhibits. And then just touring that facility. It's a state of the art facility. Um, it's called uh, CPET, and that's the Center for Petroleum uh, Energy and Technology. I'm impressed and that you remember this Thank letters. you. <laughs> it's because like, it's so exciting and it, it is, like it is. speaks to everything that we are, um, not just the, you know, I think it's the technology and, and energy piece of that that I really cling to. And then um, we're going to train people in these labs and get together and network and socialize and award people and do all the fun things. This is somebody you told me, um, or I was talking to about this conference. I was like, it's going to have all the things. So, you know, you know, get involved because if if you're listening in this, we either want you to be there um, yeah. or we want you to be involved in, and be there. So let's, let's, I don't know what I was saying there, but just to be there. Yes. If, um, it's in, again, it's in Pasadena, Texas, which is just outside of Houston, really close to Hobby Airport at San Jacinto College, which fun fact for the day for everyone listening to this podcast, I like to impart wisdom on people. San Jacinto is the birthplace of Texas. So if you want some updated Texas history from those of us who have taken at least two years in our formal education, um, about Texas history. You got Come it. into my messages. I'll let you know all about that. <laughs> and she's a proud Texan too, which yes, always yes, adds yes. to the energy when we're learning about Texas. Um, okay. So now we are going to get social. This is where we're going to tell you, teach you something you need to know about social media and the industry. And we always start with hashtag manufacturing Monday. So we're going to start with Manufacturing Monday, and this is Clay Valve. Since 1936, Clay Valve has produced the world's highest quality automatic control valves for an array of industries, right? Very diverse in their industry selection there. Uh, Clay Valve has continued to strengthen its operational and customer service capabilities around the world by enhancing product lines and state-of-the-art production facilities in warehouses in Canada, Switzerland, France, the United Kingdom, and New Zealand. Very impressive. Um, Thank you, Clay Val, for being one of our partners. We love sharing information about you. We have a highlight on you this Manufacturing Monday. Awesome. And we'd also like you to get social with us by participating in our meetups for this 
m- upcoming, no, for this month, for March. So our Empowering Pumps Meetup, if you're listening to this on the day it comes out, is happening tomorrow, Tuesday, March 15th. It happens every third Tuesday at 10 a.m. Central Time. And our guest I'm so excited about, she is one of our Empowering Women Award winners, uh, celebrity, definitely a pump celebrity. I don't know if she's been one in our magazine yet, but in her own right is a pump celebrity. Miss Hillary Johnson, she is a doctoral student and has created her own kind of pump. Um, is just so knowledgeable and I love talking to her and about her passion for the industry. It's a it's a meetup you definitely don't want to miss. I know. And it's her spring break and she's taking, you know, time mm-hmm. to, you know, finish up all of her work and then get to um, join us. And I'm really excited about that. So I hope hopefully I can tune on tune in as I'm on spring break with the children as well. But thank you so much, Hillary. Yep. Also, we have for Empowering Women several meetups. We have uh, our Mentoring Mondays, which is starting mm-hmm. today, Monday, March 14th at 11 a.m. Central Time. So if, you miss, if you're listening to this and you've missed it, you can jump in on the next one. It'll be fine. But it's Mentoring Mondays with Stacey Cassio with Pink Mentor Network. Uh, it's her give back to the community and something that you can get, gain a lot from. You'll be put into a cohort, if you will, of other people who need mentors. And I think it's going to be a great experience. I can't wait. I think it's wonderful. Um, I think we all need to be a mentor and a meet mentee at different stages of our lives. So she's sometimes at the same us. stage, you know, like you can at the same time, you can do both. Uh, I, it's it's going to be a great program. Our monthly meetup for empowering women is happening next month, Wednesday, April thirteenth. That's every second Wednesday at eleven a.m. Central Time. And then we also have our book club with Gail Rudolph's Power Up, Power Down. We just got to see her again at Empowering Women Locally. Amazing. I always learn stuff from her. Yeah. And that's going to start uh, March the 22nd. So go ahead and sign up. And we're really excited about that uh, and getting that started. Uh, I got to see Gail at the Empowering Women Local Conference. And again, she's up there on the stage, you know, teaching us a lot. (laughs) And I love to be in her presence. So um, join us for that. Power up, power down. Uh, Pre-register for those links. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> Go for you it. need to pre-register Sorry. for these events and the link is in the show notes always and make sure that you show up ready to talk, turn on your camera. We want to know about you and what you want to celebrate or what, you know, if you have a challenge, um, stay connected with us all the time at empowering pumps or using the hashtag empowering industry podcast. I love seeing people use that hashtag and I love shout outs. So we like to shout out you. Uh, we also like to get mentioned. Uh, But this is what I saw this week. Uh, Larissa Kim, the principal principal customer engagement at SAP Concord, she commented on our YouTube channel uh, on Kathleen Lane's uh, Powerful Women with Power Tools presentation. And so it wasn't directly tied to the podcast, but I feel like the podcast is leading people into our YouTube. And so it just made me super happy. And I wanted to give her a shout out because... You know, she made a really powerful comment on the page. And so y'all check it out. Yes. Love it. Okay. On to our main meat and potatoes today for social media. We're going to be talking about how to build brand awareness through social media branding. So part of building your brand awareness is people instantly being able to recognize your social media content as it belonging to your company. For example, and we're going to be talking about this specific example throughout this entire um, segment just to help illustrate what we're talking about here to you, our pump talk content that we always share, you know, because you have been a hopefully more than likely a loyal member of this pump talk community and empowering pumps and equipment audience member for the last 10 plus years, you know that Pump Talk is empowering pumps and equipment. That's who we are at our core. You know it belongs to us. And even if we didn't put on the logo on that, you would know that it comes from us. And since social media is one of the main ways that you get your messaging in front of your audience on a consistent basis, being consistent in your branding is really important to helping build that brand awareness. Yes. And I had to learn this the hard way. Uh, But consistency 
in content. So we're talking about the quality of content that you give the audience. So not salesy content, right? Um, which that's not the part I had to learn. Uh, I always <laughs> think that we've been giving out valuable content, uh, but also, you know, offer solutions to your audience and, and make sure that you're thinking of them, right? When you're creating that content, you're thinking of them. So what we do is we give regular maintenance tips and industry insights. Um, one thing that, you know, I think it's, you know, that that we need to do and kind of come up with, I guess, is a segment like we have on here, a, a special type of content uh, that you're releasing on a regular basis that people know is consistent with your brand. So for example, Pump Talk, uh, we're going to be talking about pumps and equipment and industry information um, that is going to help our audience, somebody that can use those tips and insights. Yep. Yeah. And you know, I say on here all the time, not salesy content. And that's always like something I harp on. You can still post the things you're selling. You just got to weave it in with this good content that you're offering them as well. Um, or story. other content. So step two, after you have, after you know what content you've created a segment, you know, the good content you want to share. Step two is being consistent in frequency. So you have your regular content and you want to schedule it to post at regular intervals. Give it a cool hashtag. Release it on the same day every week or every month so people come to recognize, oh, I'm always going to see that hashtag pump talk on Tuesday because that's when we talk about pump talk. Um, people are creatures of habit. You know, mm -hmm. your, your routine is usually the same each day day of every week. So like your Monday generally looks the same from Monday to Monday, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. what time you go to work, those kind of things. And so when they check their social media, they're going to get in the habit of seeing your specific content on that day. So examples we have pump talk, we have hashtag manufacturing Monday, our person of the week always goes out usually on Fridays. And it's a segment that people come to know and love and come to check mm -hmm. out because they want to see who's featured. Um, but just that in the consistency. Podcast. Yes. Yeah. Every Monday, podcast. every Monday morning. <laughs> yes. And we, we, you know, we thought about that and we plan that so that we be so that we would be consistent for you so that you can remember and stay tuned. Um, mm -hmm. So the part, the next one, consistency and visuals, this is the one that I talked about. Like I had to kind of really think about that and be consistent with our messaging um, because I like to change things up. But, you know, you can release your content on a schedule and you just need to make sure that it looks consistent to your brand. So it doesn't have to be the same every single time, but you can yes. create a graphic that you use to post every week. Uh, but you also can make a template and you can change it out um, every other week, but it still has that same general feel, uh, which I think is really important. And that is something I had to learn. Uh, have consistency, consistency in a quality of your images and videos. That's why I have Bethany, like she makes us, you know, look good, sound good. And I think that's really important. Um, I also think that every week when people, you know, see your message that you created, your graphic, right? For us, that blue empowering um, and blue pump talk uh, graphic that we send out, they know, okay, what's the tip this week? I'll tune in for that or I'll pause in the scroll, right? Yeah. Um, and I think it's important that they know what to expect too. If they click on that, they want to see something from our industry experts or a tip that we may have, um, you know, formulated for them, but they know what to expect when they click on that and spend the time to read it. It is going to be consistent with our brand. Um, and going off notes here, you're going to have to help me with the name, but last time we, when we were at TPS, I was talking to the Chesterton booth cause they were pretty mm -hmm. close to us. And the marketing person there was showing me this new graphic that they had created that they were going to use every time they had tips for people. And I was like, yes, this is exactly what we're talking about. People can start associating, um, this little Chesterton, um, a mascot person mm -hmm. with getting tips. And that's the kind of consistency and visuals that we're talking about here. Um, it worked. See, yes. it worked. Yeah. <laughs> she um, even so, remembered that it was Chesterton, which is yes. wonderful. Um, anywho, the, so next, next time we talk about social media, we'll be talking about tips for making those graphics and the images help you stand out even more to build that brand awareness, build that brand recognition. Um, 
Any final thoughts? Um, you said mentioned that people are creatures of habits. I recently learned that if you create a habit um, and you stick with it, that it takes less energy for you to do that. And I am all about that. So if you have the same food for breakfast, uh, same drink, same morning routine, you're saving energy. And I think that that is amazing. So figure out what your habit's going to be, I guess. Yes. Well, today your habit is listening to the Empowering Industry Podcast every Monday morning. Uh, And now it's time for the news. Each week, we preview news that will be coming to you in the Empowering Pumps and Equipment newsletter. It's in your inbox twice a week, has great news that you're going to want to check out. And we're going to start with our industry person of the week. And this week, it is Miss Ainhoa Lech. She is the digital water entrepreneur and executive president of Bunt Planet. Um, Really, really awesome person who I want on the podcast. I'm just going to put that into the universe, okay? (laughs) Hey, all she has to do is tell me and we'll make this happen, okay? Um, She seemed really great. Uh, I did also love her image while we're talking about image. Yes. Um, Investing in, one of the quotes that she gave was, investing in digitalization for the water sector is very is a very worthwhile mission. It has not only a very positive economic impact, but it is also valuable social impact and potentially valuable environmental impact. And so anybody who is in the water sector knows that digitization is the way to go. It will make an impact. It makes things easier. It makes people more connected and we can be less wasteful, all these things. And Anytime somebody mentions that in their profile, we're like, we need to talk to you. This is important. So really excited about um, getting to know her better. And then, you know, we want to nominate uh, people in the industry. We want you to nominate people in the industry for industry person of the week. We are going to be celebrating the industry person of the year at Epic. And so get those nominations in. You want to be a part of that. The story that I'm previewing for you today comes to us from Proco Products. It's titled, The Right Equipment and Proper Maintenance Can Extend the Life of Critical Components. It's all about how breast it's all about how best practices for expansion joints in the process industry. So like chemical processing, oil and gas, power gin, uh, pulp and paper, water, wastewater, all of those um, gives you all of the best best practices for those expansion joints. So the article is going to cover factors to consider in order to select it, select the best joint for the particular application, extending equipment life, maintenance, troubleshooting, including anchoring, blisters and cracks, leaks, extreme corrosion. In general, you know, the right expansion joints when installed correctly and cared for correctly can on average provide an average of seven to 10 years of service life in many industrial applications. Detailed installation and strictly following the OEM directions for maintenance are imperative to gaining longer system life. We're all about making those uh, making those machines last longer so you can really get your money's worth out of it. It's a really great article. It goes in depth about a lot of things. As always, Proco Products sharing great content that's really valuable for our audience. Yes, they are the expansion joint and check valve people, which is part of their brand. Uh, Okay, the message I want to share with you today is uh, from Grumpus. They are on mission to reach 300 million people with access to drinking water by 2030 with safe water. And anytime I see these organizations supporting missions like this, I just... I'm so happy. So thank you for doing that. Uh, One third of the world's population does not have access to safe drinking water. And Grumpus has introduced Safe Water. Safe Water is a strategic business unit in Grumpus aimed to create a long lasting impact by bringing commercially viable and sustainable smart water solutions to underserved communities Oh my goodness, I want to learn so much more about this. Um, Safe Water is predominantly operated in East and West Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East, and often in remote locations. That's where they don't have the water. And so in in order to support this entire value chain, they tie together all the activities because it is an end-to-end journey. Along with offering pumps and water solutions, they are actively uh, work with the local delivery. Uh, Their global footprint includes trainings, installation, and service. 
Uh, and I have just to say, like, this is so important because, you know, we, you know, I told you all about sending those pumps over the design outreach, sending those pumps over to Africa, but then they, they have to get installed in the right place. They have to, you know, teach the community how to use them and what to do with them. Um, so really excited about that. By 2030, Grumpus, that's ambitious, right? Uh, but they they have reached 300 million people with the drinking water um, is what they want to do. And this is in line with the sustainable development goal number six, uh, their purpose of pioneering solutions for the world's water and climate climate challenges to improve people's quality of life. Well done. Give them a, I have to just, yeah, all the praises on that. Thank you, Grumpus. And to interweave pretty much the whole podcast. Having a company where you can really believe in the mission and support the the things that they are doing and feeling like you're making an impact for one, I love that it's end to end there. You know, they're not just dumping products, they're teaching people how to use it. They're looking at infrastructure, which helps other things other than just getting clean water. You know, it opens the door, it literally builds roads for other things and other ways to help people. But having that company culture that you can learn from and feel proud of is something that our next industry expert who you've interviewed and is on the podcast today talks about so much. And I just, everything he was saying, I was soaking up because I'm here about learning about culture and uh, generations and how we talk to different people and how to combat the great um, resignation and all of that. Such a great interview. Why don't you introduce your guest for us today? Yes, a dear friend of mine and mentor at many times in my life, Bill Tempton. He's the CEO and co-founder of Adaptix. Uh, Bill has worked and led in both small, privately held businesses and large global multinational, uh, including the Weir Group, which is where I met him, um, the FMC Technologies, FlowServe, Solzer, uh, so he's had global roles for the last 25 years and he had started his own, uh, which I'm really excited to share with you. He has partnered with uh, Dr. David. I don't know how to say his last name. Schweiger. Schweiger. Yes. And Andrew Schweiger to launch uh, Adaptix, uh, whose, vi- whose mission is to provide organizational diagnostic data and insights um, not previously available. And I think they understand that data is important and what do we, it's important because it helps us with our employees and what our employees are doing out in everyday life, you know, for your businesses. And I just really enjoy, you have to listen to the interview um, in his spare time, Bill mentors others. And he also, of is course he ad- does. Of course he does. <laughs> He's just uh, the best person. <laughs> so it's not listed in his bio. I just had to say that. Uh, but he enjoys golf. He's a cyclist. Uh, you know, he enjoys life too, just hanging out with his wife and his family, grilling, cooking, you know. And so he's an overall, you know, amazing guy um, that has a lot of industry knowledge. So I'm happy to share his interview with you. Without further delay, here's your interview. So excited to have you here. I have Bill Tipton. I mean, so much I can say about you, uh, but welcome to the Empowering Industry Podcast. I'm happy to have you here. I'm happy to be able to like, be able to introduce you um, to the industry, but I like to throw it at you to do that. And so tell me a little bit about who you are, what you're doing. Sure. Um, well, thanks so much. Charlie, for having me on. This is my first podcast ever, so I'm a total newbie. (laughs) I love a newbie. Um, It'll be really fun. Yeah. Uh, I spent 30 plus years in manufacturing. Uh, Charlie, you and I met in uh, the pump world many years ago. Over a decade, we'll say. Over a decade ago, we met in the pump industry, and um, after uh, working in strategy, business development, sales, account management, having global roles for 25 of the last 30 years, I decided to move out of that space and start a new company called Adaptix, and 
through the many years of working in industry, worked through a whole host of industry consolidations in the pump industry. Everyone that's been around that knows all about that. And that continues today. Um, and so really one of the name people, you know, as far as in our industry, you've worked with some of the major corporations out there and, you know, the expertise that you've gained. Um, I, I mean, I just love sitting and talking with you and getting <laughs> yeah. some of that knowledge. Yeah. So, you know, um, c- companies that I've worked for and with include um, the Weir Group, where it was almost 10 years where I really uh, learned a lot about culture and post acquisition integrations because I led two of those um, uh, with the Weir Oil and Gas Division. Um, through through those trials and tribulations and all of the uh, co- consolidations and acquisitions we did at FlowServe during the the FlowServe years with BWIP and Durco coming together, the, the continuous battle within the cultures to bring people together, to bring organizations together. Um, just felt like after 35 years that there was a better way. There had to be a better way. Um, And so part of my motivation was find a better way to deal with strategy and execution of strategy because we hear it all the time. Culture eats strategy for lunch. And it gets in the way. And I have many experiences that uh, validate that statement. Well, I know I have experience with you sitting at, you know, that, <laughs> at that very first table with you. And you're like, no, nope, you're not. That There's another way to do this. Think about it a little bit more. Yeah. And, you know, that's the start of our journey, which I, I think it's that strategic mind of yours um, that is, is what we need. And we need to talk yeah. about this for, for yeah. sure. And um, so my motivation was also, though, to give back to enable people that were that are doing the job I used to do to do it better and faster and quicker Um, because I'm achievement driven 100 miles an hour and I generally have to slow down you know when when working with lots of people in lots of different cultures because we all run at different speeds but I wanted something quick and easy and fast for leaders to be able to really get to the point of what was getting in the way of alignment, for example, within the team, management team, executive team, you know, the product development team, just fill in the blank. Um, But the desire to give back was also a big part of what I wanted to do because there there just had to be a better way for people to avoid the pitfalls I went through. Mm -hmm. Now, those pitfalls gave me a certain experience, wisdom, knowing, Um, learning mostly from my own mistakes rather than the mistakes of others. Um, So uh, had a chance to um, meet up with uh, some two new friends, uh, Dr. David Schweiger and his son, Andrew, and we put together and cultivated the idea of adaptics, of delivering diagnosis of organizations that were never available before. So we can go in um, through uh, almost it's, it's a, it's would resemble a survey only it's, it, it's better constructed than a typical survey because the data um, feeds computations, the computations then deliver analytics and data and insights to the leaders, executive teams, so they know exactly where their gaps are in their organization's competencies, for example, or more importantly, misalignments between groups in their organizations. Um, and those misalignments are the opportunities to go address, fill the gap and move on. But the diagnosis um, isn't just about what's what the problems or gaps are. It also highlights the strengths that you can leverage. So an organization or a team might have really strong alignment around certain aspects of their organization. They can figure out, well, what process did we use to get there? And we can use that to fill the gaps. So um, 
the other thing is we wanted to, you know, because we had this desire to give back, it had to work in most all organizations. So it can work for not for profit, not for profits. Mm-hmm. It can work for for profits. It can work for small organizations, 50 people to 5,000 to 50,000. Um, and we can slice and dice the organization into different groups to compare, to really dig into where there may be challenges or issues and help the leaders, um, you know, understand what's really going on in the bowels of the organization. And, and so uh, one of our little marketing uh, pitches is if your organization could speak, what would it say? In my experience over the many years, people would tell me kind of what I wanted to hear. And only those that were really brave and bold would tell me what I needed to hear. And I think this is just part of being human in organizational business life, right? It it takes a lot of trust to be able to tell someone they're messing up or there's a different way. Yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy it's to not say easy. those words to somebody or to receive those words. And so that's part of the traditional issue is that you can't get the real data and honest, candid verbatims from people. So we created these diagnostics so that people would be protected 100%. Their anonymity can't be devol- We cannot, we, even us, cannot know what Charlie scored on certain items of a leadership diagnostic, for example. We can't pull the the data apart. Your data would go into a group or a set of groups, and we can't de-aggregate that. Mm -hmm. That creates this safety zone. So all the respondents, let's say all the employees in an organization, um, diagnosing or providing data to help the leadership team be more effective. Um, We give them a safe place to do that. Um, We also do this in a way that it's not disruptive to the leadership team and it's not labor intensive for them because generally, if you wanted to do some kind of diagnosis of your organization, you'd need a consultant time um, and you probably couldn't get that data in less than a month like we can provide it would be many months and lots of hours and can be frankly a distraction for the day-to-day that's that's going on so yeah, i think well i was going to say i think it's really uh added value that you can't see who put that information in there because i've done surveys before and they you know that they know it's coming from you somewhere down the yeah. line so i think that's a really really good point yeah, and and uh, you know all, all of the calculations is all um, technology driven, so it's all web based. Um, we make it really easy for the clients to help us set up the test for them. Um, their uh, respondents then provide the data, and then the reports are basically available within twenty four hours to begin breaking down the action priorities. Um, So it's really unique. There's nothing like it in the industry. Um, As a strategy and marketing guy, I spent loads of time trying to find out who does this work that we're wanting to do. We couldn't find anyone. And we still spend time every month just looking for competitors. I know they're coming because this is a data-driven solution set. The analytics do matter, but getting analytics from your organization to help you craft alignment exercises to get everybody on board for what's really wanting to get done, but also give the the workers and the employees a voice, a voice they never really had before. And it's I'm not I'm not talking about um, employee satisfaction surveys. Those those have a great place. They do an excellent job. That's not the space that we're focused on. We're focused on um, alignment within the organization, helping the leaders really understand their behaviors and how they could do a better job. Or if they're, if they are messing up, give them a chance to have new conversations with themselves about what they can do to um, 
do a better job. And so it is pretty exciting stuff, but it's brand new. Um, we had to build the technology. We had to build the marketing machine to get the word out. And so happy to say that we are fully operational now. And it's, it's taken longer than I had thought. Um, the technology um, continues to advance so quickly that the things that we knew two years ago are now far different today. Yeah, and, lots of and, things have changed in the last two years that we had yeah, to and, include and, and, in there, right? Yeah, and it's interesting. We started this business in June of 2020, right after COVID hit. <laughs> So we decided we're going to have a virtual business. We're going to only have remote work. We're going to do asynchronous work. We're going to have our own schedules and our own work-life balance. And we're going to find time to meetings and collaboration and creativity and socialization. Um, so we did loads of research on that, which led to our first instrument, the remote workforce and managing a remote workforce. So in that diagnostic, which is really an extension of leadership, is leaders, managers, HR professionals put in policies and plans to manage and to manage a remote workforce, even if it's in a hybrid type where you got two, two days at home and three days in the office, still remote. And then more importantly, we give the workers a chance to reflect and score how they are experiencing those kinds of policies and plans again. A great example is the executives all agree and are all lined up that all the workers have the equipment they need to do the job effectively, and they've all been trained. And then you go ahead and run the diagnostic and you compare the executives that are all lined up. Yeah, we've done a good job. It's all done. And then you go to the remote workers and say, eh, not so much. We disagree. And there's the gap. And, and then now you have open conversations that what's really going on, okay? Because an individual remote worker has only one voice, but you put that whole workforce together into one major group that's, let's say, 50 versus seven executives, there's a gap there. And, you know, it, it would probably need to be rectified pretty quickly for that workforce working remotely to be more productive. I mean, clearly, because sure. all, all we want is, is financial success for our clients, effective leadership, um, high morale, retaining talent, and even to the point in the organizational life, building that such that it's an attractor to new talent. We notice in the news every day, the great resignation. Well, why are people leaving? Well, there's a whole host of reasons. So um, it, it's important. So we've really focused on organizational life and how to make it better. But all of our products or instruments um, focus on specific challenges or opportunities for organizations to improve. Um, and like I said, it's, it's not just for for-profit organizations. It, it can be, we're really industry agnostic. Um, whether it's a not-for-profit or a for-profit, um, it, it all, it all can work for everyone, frankly. Yeah. I was just, I was just thinking how, you know, we all talk about the data and, you know, I think it's really important that we're getting the data, but then it, ha having the conversations and interpreting it and, and being there and having leaders on your team that can help them along the way to interpret that data. I think that's really important too. I mean, if I had a question in strategy or business, uh, you're definitely somebody I would come to to kind of like, let's talk about this. Let's think through this and th these options. And one of the things, you know, that I'm really curious about from your perspective is, you know, what we should be looking for. Um, I think, I mean, now that you have access to all of this data, what are you seeing? What are these trends out there that we need to make sure that we pay attention to? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, one of the things we're committed to at Odaptics is having relevant and timely products. So as the market changes, we adjust our own products and the items therein to reflect what's really going on in the world today. 
meaning we're not going to allow our instruments or products to get stale, right? Um, so coming back to your question, there's a couple trends going on now that we find very interesting and all of our products um, have some kind of reflection of. One is the generational turnover. Boomers beginning to retire or already retiring and potentially leaving talent gaps in organizations. Okay. So how do you fill those talent gaps and how do you fill backfill um, that expertise that's now looking to retire? Um, you have uh, Gen Zers coming in. These are uh, new employees that grew up with technology and can jump right in and are, and, and, can be excellent workers. We have, and, and so um, that generational turnover is one it, it is a, a non-trivial trend that's going on globally. I, and I believe strongly that leaders need to pay attention to what the Gen Zers needs are and what the boomers needs are. And of course the millennials and, and the Gen Xers that are, that are the meat in the sandwich, right? Yeah, I think they have to have patience for each other, too. I think, you know, just because one person's super savvy in technology doesn't mean, you know, you couldn't learn from them and vice versa. The people that maybe take a little bit longer to do a program or, or the technology, you know, help them along. So so I think that there's some patience that has to be um, given. Yes, I've learned many things since launching Adaptix because we have... Uh, a team that includes a 20 year old, 21 year old that's still in school, a 40 year old, myself, 60 ish, um, and, and two others that are older than I am. I'm not even going to put their, their ages out there. We have large gaps in ages, experience, and ability, for example, to interface with technology. Right. And it's, and I can tell you from our small organization, it is not trivial. And that patience I've had to learn. I'm not patient generally, Charlie, as you may have we're figured both, out. We're, we're like, go, 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 uh, <laughs> but, activators, right? <laughs> so uh, we talk about, you know, circling back continuously and making sure everybody's comfortable with where we are, where we're headed, the priorities, and how, it, how the technologies are working. We have a tech-based firm, yet there's three of us that are, you know, boomers for sure that all at times struggle with the technology and, you know, part of it's, you know, seat time or saddle time. A uh, part of it is just, okay, it's a new, new discipline that's required, but, uh, Landon, our youngest, uh, he helps us with the marketing content videos, um, that we do. He, he wants to go hundred miles an hour. And he's good to go. He doesn't need the coaching. And so the patience that you mentioned is absolutely critical, whether, you know, our organization, very small to one that has 50 or 500 people, it's the same patience that would be required. Absolutely agree. Yeah. Okay. So digital, uh, d definitely something, right? You've built a digital technology company, but what else have you seen in that space? Well, it's certainly since COVID hit, the um, number of patents is interesting. The number of new patents since COVID started are almost 80% or 70% are tech digital technology based. Can you think, think about that? That's, that's amazing. <laughs> and so, you know, we said we want to have a data centric solution. So we needed technology computations, a way to gather that data. And so we're using technology. So there's programmers required. But with the remote worker that, you know, there was like 15% remote workers prior to COVID and then it shot up overnight to 50%, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and now people are ebbing and flowing with the COVID variants. Are, are we going back to the office or are we not going back to the office? So digital technologies were employed overnight mm -hmm. to enable people to communicate, socialize, and be more productive while working remotely or from home. Um, I think there's a, there was a statement early on 
in during COVID that many large corporations uh, technology plans were accelerated two years over one night. Wow. That acceleration is what we're all trying to, it's like surfing, right? Catch the wave and get on the right side of the wave. And a lot of companies I reckon are investing uh, heartily um, and uh, our diagnosis, Gnostics actually look at that technology, how, how, much, how much new digital technology are being implemented. Is it only for, for operations or is it going all the way to the core of the business and how you develop new products, new services, and, and certainly how you deploy those to your customers, clients, or, or um, distributors, right? So it's absolutely non-trivial. It's going faster and faster. Um, and so that is a big part of our future life, whether we like it or not. Um, and so, you know, we've embraced that at Adaptics, being tech-based and being a service firm and all of our products are delivered digitally in web-based programs, really easy for our clients to get to and understand and, and get and receive the data they need quickly without um, any or very much, there's no FaceTime required. Um, which is interesting. So, and I think that's, I'm not saying that's our model, but different, um, you know, financial services, um, e even insurance, which over the many, many generations has thought of themselves as only a face-to-face -face service business. Well, that's not possible. And they've found over the last two years, well, technology can get you to screen to screen rather face-to-face. -face. I mean, the, yeah, fact that we're on a, the fact that we can do a, a, a Zoom call or a podcast from anywhere on the planet anytime is incredible. I yeah, remember I like when it. I remember when video conferencing equipment was first coming out when I was at FlowServe in, in the 2000s. And we tried it for a while and then we just, just jumped back on planes and started flying around the planet again because it, it was just it wasn't good enough yet. Um, that's all, you know, far behind us now as we speak to each other on, uh, this particular venue. So, yeah, excellent. I love it. You know, yeah. I, I think that that definitely, I'm, I'm glad that everybody that needed to invested in it so that we could be at this point today. And then, you know, to the point, some people are very far behind. Some people weren't um, using digital technology at all. And so they're, they're having to struggle a little bit more than, than say somebody that's in the digital yeah. always. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's important to look at all people, right. And make sure yeah. that we're, building things that include everyone that is in your organization or, or that you're wanting to touch. A absolutely. I think um, social awareness has, imp ha has improved dramatically uh, over the past two years. Um, and, and we all know uh, the different events that occurred, the George Floyd, for example, all of these things point to, not just racial equality, but um, equality socially. Um, so diversity, equality, and inclusion are key factors in organizational life that maybe in the past were pushed to the corner of the room, not anymore. We, we know from our research that consumers will move away from a popular brand if the leadership team doesn't represent this social awareness that's important to the consumer, the customer they're trying to sell to. Okay. And there's many examples in the media where you can point to that occurring. So our diagnostics look at, at, at items that test you. Are you, are you recruiting qualified, competent people with various backgrounds? Okay. Mm -hmm. Are, are people from various backgrounds included in key important projects, right? That's key. I, I think that's it's a big key. one. Yeah. And then, of course, the inclusion means also is that when you're engaging your employees in your organizational life, you're doing it in a way that makes sense to them, not just the communicator. Yeah. And, and so th there's a lot of learning there for everyone, whether you're 
a supervisor or a mental manager or an executive, uh, it's part of it's back to your patient's fr- note from earlier uh, and and really being more aware of of the potential uh, around you. Our, from our research, we reckon that the more diverse your workforce, the more creative and innovative you can be to solve problems and serve your customers, grow your business and achieve your uh, ambitions strategically as a business. But you think about a a, a not-for-profit, it's the same. They're not trying to make a a profit per se, but they still have to fundraise. They still have costs. And then they still want to then push the value out to charities, communities. So, So it's the same thing. So we, we reckon that this is something that all leaders, um, especially executives and uh, upper management, need to be aware of. Um, and they have to have policies, procedures, and behaviors that reflect that. It starts with yeah. recruiting, right? Um, it starts with really being aware of, of what good looks like going forward. And yeah, so, I think oh, being aware of it, I mean, number one, being aware and intentional that this needs to happen. And, and you know, I think your platform sounds like you can get that information and data um, that's going to help you make better decisions. Yeah, absolutely. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a, a much larger risk of consumer or, or customer loss. Mm-hmm. Should you not display these um the, the the equity inclusion and diversity uh, th- that that comes with the social awareness or, or the or the awakening so to speak um and, and that includes the environment and, and other things as well as the social a- awareness um it does matter it especially matters to the younger generations that we mentioned the gen zers need need to know that you're caring about the planet and you're caring about each other that may not be a value that's shared by other generations yet. Yeah, but, but we're going to have to appreciate and empathize and understand why they feel that way and how we can create a business where they do feel that they matter yeah. and their opinions uh, yeah. matter for sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, as we talk about <clears throat> the social awareness, it also kind of begins to point to values and purpose. Mm-hmm. Right. Am I really going to keep buying a certain product from a certain company, even when my values and their brand don't align? Again, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're seeing through our research, you know, consumers leaving brands that that just don't line up with their values. But value and purpose also now comes back into the organizational life that. People just don't want a job to make money. They want a job where they matter and they can fulfill a purpose that matters to them in the organization they're working so hard um, to, to generate, you know, revenue, profits, customer satisfaction, on-time delivery. You know, it really doesn't matter. So I think there's that's another place where leaders across the planet have to be more and more aware that people need to see a connection between their purpose and their value to the mission statement of, let's say the business or a Mm -hmm. not-for-profit. That's a whole nother arena, new and different that we haven't seen in the past, you know, decade for Mm -hmm. sure. At least our research is definitely pointing to that. And our youngest employee, Landon, he's all over that. When we first, interviewed him and chatted with him and, and, and started his onboarding. That was like his number one thing is to work for a company that was doing something that mattered. Wow. And, and the energy that those employees bring is awesome. So tapping into that is good. Not tapping into that and recognize that as an HR professional or an executive leading an organization, that that's something you want to take a hard look at. Yeah. The other side of that too, is just understanding your values. I think, you know, us as a people, we have to kind of look inward and see what, 
what is our values? And maybe if there's a conflict at work kind of constantly, maybe it's because it doesn't align with your values. And so understanding ourselves, our leaders need to understand themselves and how they're showing up. And so I love how this all kind of comes together to say, okay, let's, let's look at the data. Let's look at people. Let's look at where we need to go forward. And, and you're creating that tool to help people get there. Yeah. And we've designed our, our diagnostics to address certain challenges that leaders and executives have had for, for decades. Um, so for example, let's say there's a brand new leadership team that's brought into a business and it's a mix of people from outside the firm and inside the firm, but it's a brand new leadership team. In a traditional way, they'd spend six months feeling each other out, going through the, the forming, storming, norming cycles that all new teams go through. And after a while, you might have some success, but there's a lot of time that's been that they've had to go through to get to from point A to point B to point C. When we work with a new management team, what we do is we allow the entire workforce to first tell us through the diagnostic tool what an ideal leadership behavior is going to look like for them. And then we let the new leadership team work together for a couple months and then we run the assessment again and then analyze the actual behaviors that the organization is experiencing versus the ideal behaviors they'd like to see. And then that creates the gap for the new leadership team to look at their own behaviors and how they're interacting with the organization and then begin changing how they lead, how they communicate, how they engage, to be much more effective. And by doing that, now you're starting to align people up around the same vision, the same purpose, the same values. And when you, when you do that, the leadership team becomes more effective, morale improves, um, and, and you probably will avoid talent loss. Ultimately, all that will point to financial success, which is what we're endeavoring to do here. Um, the point is, any of our diagnosis can be can be used to, to solve certain challenges, but also provide the executives with a major return on investment. Um, part of that is time savings. Part of it's cash flow. Part of it would be improved top line performance um, in executing strategic initiative. And I spent many decades trying to get that done but without the alignment from the organization and the culture. It's, it's very challenging, very difficult. It doesn't need to be that bad. The other thing with data, because the entire organization has a voice to speak, everyone's involved. Everyone now has skin in the game. It's not just those guys or those girls that need to do the work. We're, we're all in this now, mm -hmm. and we all have a part to play to fulfill the purpose. And then when we line all that out, financial success will follow. And this is the part that, you know, that that's, that's really good. You know, we have a saying, you know, you start looking at yourself in the mirror with data that can be very empowering, right? It can also be quite scary, right? Cause now yeah. you go, ah, I thought I was right, but I wasn't right. Mm -hmm. I thought I was doing a good job, but I'm not. Well, that's just an opportunity to, to improve, right? And one of the things, one of the analogies we use, Charlie, in explaining how we really help at Adaptics, it's looking at the professional athlete. Almost every professional athlete, doesn't matter what the sport is, has a trainer. And that trainer has somebody to do diagnostics and testing on the athlete's performance. We at Adaptics are the data guys that design the test and run the analytics so that the athlete knows what their VO2 max score is, what their acceleration in a 40-yard dash is, 
how fast they can swim a hundred meters, right? All, all of these things are tests that are done by the diagnostic people working with the professional athlete. Then the coach of that athlete begins helping craft action plans, training plans for the athlete. In the end, the athlete has to do the work. Okay. So in our case in business, we're the data people. We design the tests and the analysis and provide the data. The coach can either be internal to the organization or an external consultant that can work. And the athlete, the organization in this case, has to do some work to improve their performance. But, but it's all, you know, sometimes consultants are hired in when things are going bad. Um, we're advocating even if things are going well, you can always do better. Um, and because our diagnostics are so easy to deploy, gather data and quickly give um, the feedback in our balanced reports, it takes very little time and, and the cost is, is not that much compared to the benefit of, of, of what you get um, top, top line and or profits and or morale. The other thing we can do is uh, the athlete now is starting to make changes in the training and starting to work. Well, there's another test that would be done with the athlete. How far have you come? We can do the same thing. Pulse tests every six months, every quarter. And those data metrics can be pulled back into operational dashboards, HR metrics and whatnot to verify the organization is improving quarter by quarter. And you can actually see the alignments close up, the gaps close up and you know, I would expect morale to improve because you've got a lot more engaged in the workforce, frankly. Um, yeah, so it's interesting sure. when you start breaking this down of how we help others, how we help organizations. It's all for the sake of the people, the culture, the executives, the consumer, the customer, the top line, the profitability. It all works together. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, you know, Culture eats strategy for lunch every day. And the culture is really the combination of all of that, right? The combination of the leaders engaging, the workers feeling aligned, purposeful in their day-to-day -day work, um, productive, whether working from home or elsewhere in the shop. Um, so those, those things all matter to me because I was immersed in that for so many years and there's just, there's a better way. And, 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 uh, we really feel strongly that we've got, got some real cool things that we can offer to help people improve. Well, I love it. It makes me like, think of the company that's, that's doing this type of work. Like I want to work there. I want to work for the company that's thought about all these things that, you know, has the tools that, you know, if something is not going right, that it can improve. But then, you know, sometimes you think it's going right, but you don't have all the feedback. And so it's important to get that feedback uh, when things are going well too. So it, it just helps in business. Okay. So I could talk to you all, all day. I feel like I've learned a ton already. Uh, I want to give people a way to connect with you, uh, in case they, um, you know, are just interested in the product or you as a person, uh, what's the best way that people can get in touch with you? Sure. Um, various ways, right? Um, first, probably easiest way is on LinkedIn. I'm under William Tipton. And uh, if you uh, search for me there, you'll find me, uh, or Adaptics, you can find us uh, on LinkedIn. Um, if you go to our website and you fill out one of the contact forms, you can actually get on my calendar via the website as well. So those are probably the two easiest, best ways. And of course, if you want to send me an email, old fashioned way, it's btipton at odaptics.com. And we'll put all this in the show notes for everybody. And just thank you for your time today, Bill. It's been a pleasure seeing you and, and getting, you know, I get all the feels. I feel like I, I've just learned some strategy and also, you know, making sure I look at my culture uh, for our company as well. And just, yeah, thanks for your time. Yep. Pleasure. Thank you. And we're back. Charlie, 
I'm going to just tell everyone all day long that culture eats strategy for, what did he keep saying? For breakfast, mm -hmm. Trump strategy, like such a great culture. Yeah. Culture. Gotta yes. Have yes. Gotta have, gotta have it. it. Um, and I really liked this. He's found the sweet spot, you know, where like soft sciences meet hard sciences, where he's talking about people and their thoughts and their attitudes and, and how they approach things. But he's giving you hard data and numbers and how you can analyze it and apply it at your company. Just fascinating, really fascinating stuff. I hope everyone got as much out of it as I did. And if you're confused or need more information, he will be happy to talk to you and share. And um, I think we'll see him at Epic too. So this brings us to the end of our show. Thanks for listening. Uh, yeah. Do us a favor, subscribe, rate and review the podcast on iTunes. Uh, yeah, this is my turn again. Um, <laughs> You can always reach us at Empowering Pumps or using the hashtag Empowering Industry Podcast. Email us podcast at empoweringpumps.com. Yep. Next week, it's going to be a little bit different show. Charlie and I are on spring break this week, and we know a lot of you are as well. So we're going to be releasing a couple of interviews that we've done. So you're not going to hear me and Charlie chat on the podcast, but we'll be back the week after that. Uh, but have some great interviews for you in the meantime. Yes. And I can't wait to hear those two of my favorite uh, women coming up. And so until then, I mean, we did it. So until then, be empowering. We did it. I'm not going to be late. <laughs>